Welcome back, everybody, to Unsense CMO. Now, one of the really hot topics I know gets everyone very excited is the relationship between the client and the agency. Now, I've spent most of my career client side, so I've got a great perspective on that. But my next guest, Richard Warren, has spent most of his career building agencies, working in media, working in creative. And more recently in his career, he's gone client side, running some of the biggest banking and financial services brands in the country. I thought this would be a great chance to talk about something I've wanted to talk about for a long time, which is how do you get the most out of the client and agency relationship? Because when you get that right, it leads to amazing work. So he is the perfect guest to get into this, and we've got lots of hot topics to cover. So without further ado, let's get into it. Here's my conversation with Richard Warren. I'm very pleased to be joined by Richard Warren, who is actually, as we speak, between jobs. So I thought this might be the perfect chance to get him uncensored because he hasn't got any well I assume he hasn't got any obligation no, to, uh, I'm still to anybody under at this all moment. All employment contractual guidelines with Lloyd's Banking Group. So uh, so no I won't be falling afoul of those. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Well this is great. <clears throat> Thank you for taking the time to to come and talk to us. Yeah. You know you spent a lot of time on a career agency side. Yes. Uh, more recently in your career gone client side. Um, I've done the opposite. So yeah. I've been mostly client side agency. So I thought it'd be a really good time to have a conversation Definitely. about agencies and clients and how to get the best out sure. of the work. Um, but for everyone listening and watching, tell us a bit about who you are and your journey, because you've had some interesting kind of connections through your career that kind of bring you to where you are today, haven't you? Indeed. I basically uh, fell in love with uh, advertising when I was at uni and uh, haven't lost my love for advertising ever since. And, uh, you know, I'm one of those people who... Uh, has found the thing that they love doing and I'm amazed to get actually paid for it. So uh, I've been very lucky in that respect. And I've, I've pretty much done all of the jobs that you can do in, in the advertising and marketing world in that I started off as a uh, trainee account person at uh, Publicis and then uh, went to an agency called Shiat Day. Then I went uh, across the Atlantic and worked in New York for an agency called Kirschenbaum and Bond, which was an amazing uh, experience, did that for four years. Then I actually came back as a planner and converted over to planning and then uh, was the uh, the strategy partner of uh, Delaney Lundnox Warren, which uh, set up in 2000. So uh, did that for about uh, 10 years, then became the CEO of that agency, did that for five years and then decided that I actually really loved media and I've always, always loved media and uh, managed to get a job with Group M. Uh, running an agency they'd set up servicing Lloyd's Banking Group, which was called Greenhouse. Did that for a year. And then whilst I was there, my client, a brilliant woman called uh, Ros King, she resigned. And to her great credit, she uh, said to me, Richard, how about coming to do my job? And I'd never thought, you know, I wanted to go client side. I'd always assumed I'd be uh, agency till I died. But I'd worked with all the, the team at Lloyd's. I really loved them, respected them, thought they were all awesome. So yeah, moved across to Lloyd's Banking Group five years ago and have now done that for five years. So apart from uh, the creative part of the job, I've done pretty much everything. So what's really interesting about this is you've done the creative for them, yeah. you've done the media for them, yeah. and you're now working for them, right? Yeah. So that's a pretty unusual, you've seen it from all kind of three sides. Oh. I'd love to know, when you went client side for the first time, what surprised you, you know, having worked in agencies doing creative and media, what was it like going client side and what did you learn in those first few weeks? I think I knew it already, but I was so surprised by how brilliant the other people were that I worked with client side. And I think that, you know, in advertising, certainly when I started, agencies used to be incredibly disparaging about clients. And they were like, you know, they're stupid and we are the people who are going to tell them what they need to do. And only we are the experts. And if we were investment bankers, they would just, you know, happily take our advice, which isn't true. And we can talk about that. And I think that, you know, what I was so amazed by and so impressed by was how brilliant the people I work with at Lloyd's were. I mean, just incredibly bright incredibly marketing literate and desperate to do the right thing. Funny you say it, you, you give me a bit of deja vu. Years ago, I was invited to sit on a panel, um, a, a, an agency event, so, so probably about 100 people from agencies there, talking about the pitch process, right? And I was the, I was the nominal client on the panel representing kind of the client point sure. of view. And it felt like I was in the lion's den. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you the anger and frustration and almost hurt, I think, that... Yeah that was being directed to me. I almost felt like I was like literally apologizing on behalf of clients everywhere. So it was, it was quite visceral, you know, and I remember I, I said to them, I said, look, remember this one thing. And this was no, I wasn't exaggerating at all. I said, tomorrow morning, 
I'm going to wake up at 4 a.m. I'm driving to Newcastle because I have a pitch to Greg's the Baker yeah. to try and maintain a listing for my brand, yeah. which is the worth 30% of my turnover. Sure. I said, every customer of yours yeah. has a customer who is yeah. as demanding Absolutely. and as, as painful as you're feeling it right now. Yeah. And I said, look, I, I, you know, I, I'm sure the pitch process is horrible, but just remember that if you can help solve your client's pain and help them win their pitch to their customer, sure. honestly, you'll be you'll be in a great position. Yeah, and I think agencies are a lot lot better at this now. So I think I think you know the time I'm talking about is is in the sort of uh, 1990s where agencies were very arrogant. But I think that now I think good agencies have got a really good understanding of of you know the client's own customers and. You know, if you explain to them, you know, we've got this issue with, you know, mortgage um, sales amongst first time buyers, they completely get that that is the issue. And it's not just about producing uh, the next ad. So I think I think agencies have made big, big advances in the last decade in terms of get much better understanding of clients. Now, I noticed you won um, three IPA goals. So yeah. congratulations. Yeah. It's, it's always good. I have to say as a client yeah. that they're, they're Probably the most reassuring yes. awards to win. I know yes. whenever I was sat in reception, kind of waiting to meet an agency, I was a lot more reassured by the FE count than the Can Lion count yes. because yes. basically one is for the industry, the other one is for the customer, sure. really. You know, sure. so I was always. But IPA is about as good as you're going to get, really, sure. in terms of yes. the rigor that goes into those yeah. awards. Um, tell me what you won them for, and tell me what I particularly want to understand is why did you win them, mm. and what can we learn from them. To be fair, two of them were for the same campaign, which was the uh, Halifax uh, um, Howard Brown campaign, which I'll talk about in, in, in a moment. The other one was for Digital UK, and that was about when the UK was being converted to digital TV. And it was a very specific task, which was that everyone was going to convert anyway. And what we were looking to do was to get the last 10% of people who weren't going to do it. So it was a very specific piece of targeting and type of advertising. But I think what was interesting about the Halifax Howard Brown campaign, which we won the gold award for and also integrated comms, it, it was a sort of early example of a completely integrated idea, what you would call a, a fluent device, in that we took... Um, something which was true of the brand, which was that staff or colleagues, as they were called, were at the heart of the brand, and we made them heroes. So the, the campaign we called Star for Stars, and obviously the first star was the, was Howard Brown, who we never expected to completely sort of take over the campaign and dominate the campaign, and uh, you know did absolute gangbusters in terms of the brand. Into, you know blew the socks off in terms of every advertising metric, every sales metric, and it and it created you know, this amazing integrated campaign from the company out. And it was a fascinating campaign for us as an agency because we'd won this account in our first year. We'd set up this agency and we managed to win Halifax in year one. And we created this campaign, which, as I said, did incredibly well in the real world. But the advertising industry didn't like it at all because they were like, that bloke can't sing. All the best campaigns. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, you know, th this is not very well crafted. You know, this is this is not polished. You know, it was in the era of when X Factor was just starting. So these are, you know, these are amateurs that are on the screen. And we thought, what do we actually mind about this? Do we mind about the fact that the industry doesn't like this campaign, but yet our client loves it? You know, it's working fantastically well. And other marketing directors are all coming to us and saying, we love your, you know, Halifax campaign. Can we have some of that? So it was a new business train for us. And it became very defining for us as an agency and we said you know this is what we believe we don't care what the industry think you know um, our creative director had this soundbite about you know we create work for uh, um, taxi drivers not awards juries and we became very proud about the fact that we were a populist agency I remember a friend of mine saying Richard you know your agency is all a bit ITV as they and I was <laughs> so thinking, that's, that's a problem yeah like... that was a problem this is like the most <laughs> mass market brand you can possibly be and he was being disparaging that our advertising output was too ITV. So, and that just sort of fortified our belief that yes, you know, what we were was was all about you know populist advertising for the people and not worrying so much about what the industry thought. You're so right because most most CMOs, most marketing directors have got to go and take the campaign that your agency have created yeah. and go and sell it into their customers. Absolutely. They've got to sell it into the board. They've got to show it to their employees. Yeah. And you know you have that cringe moment if if you've got a, if you've got a maybe one that's won awards for being brave or sure. whatever, 
But actually what you need is to have something that could demonstrably works, makes yeah. the organization feel proud, yeah. you know, actually leads, you know, to sales and, and business effects. So I can, I can really understand that. And um, I've always wondered, is Howard an actual, was he actually an employee yeah. of Halifax? Yeah. So he really was yeah. a, an he, employee. He, he worked in the Sheldon branch. Uh, we conducted, you know, it was a, it was an amazing sort of creative idea because we basically did this whole call for um, participants. So we actually got Jonathan Ross to do it. He had this video and, and basically we got all the colleagues who wanted to take part down to London's swanky West End. You know, they were all up on stage. They did their, you know, turns and then we selected a whole batch of them. So actually, you know, in the first instance, we had several stars. So there was Yvonne and there was Matt and so on. But Howard just completely took over. And uh, so it eventually became the Howard Brown campaign. But uh, but it did mean that we could feature colleagues in all sorts of comms. So all the branch um, advertising had colleagues in, you know, videos would have colleagues in. And, and, you know, the person who ran Halifax at the time, this chap, Andy Hornby, he'd come from Asda and he was passionate about making Halifax a retail brand. And it was all about, you know, we're our colleagues. Asda were famous that. I remember Alan Layton at the time Absolutely. as well. He he, he was yeah, big yeah. on the kind of so colleague they, engagement. Yeah. He'd, he'd come from Asda and they used to premiere the ads at the Birmingham NEC. So I remember Howard coming on to stage in a limo once and actually performing the song live before the ad had broken. And colleagues just absolutely bloody loved it because we were debuting the ads live in front of them, um, you know, before it was even shot. So it became a sort of amazing, you know, it ran for 10 years and I think, you know, would be agreed to be the most successful campaign in financial servicing during that period. And and still, you know, bedevils Halifax as a brand yeah, because exactly. everyone... Uh, you know, talks about bringing about Howard and where is Howard. And you write about the era because that was very much when X Factor was at exactly. the peak of its yeah. fame and it was yeah. the number one yeah. TV show and yeah. so on. Yeah. Everyone, Saturday night, yeah, Alexandra Burke, that whole era. Yes, Will it was. Young. Yeah, yeah, almost, that was when you guarantee a Christmas number one, couldn't yeah. you? If you exactly. want X Factor, it's yeah. almost a done yeah. deal. Um, I wanted to ask you, so what do you wish you knew now? So now you're a client, yeah. tell me what you wish you knew as in, in terms of agency. That you know now? I think how how aligned with you clients are. So I think I think there's still this thing with agencies that they think they have to get things past clients or around clients or they need to compensate in some way. And I think that agencies will be very surprised as to how aligned clients want to be. And if you can spend time agreeing, we had this great thing which was very successful for us at DRKW called Shared Agenda, where we actually spent time to go off-site with the client and, and, and create a shared agenda. So we said, and, and, and within that, you would uncover all these sort of really interesting sort of client fixations. So, you know, why do you only ever present one idea? You know, and they were so passionate about it. And you said, okay, fine, we'll always present three. And that will be part of the shared agenda with this client. And we had a, another example with the Financial Times who were obsessed with us presenting on the day. So, you know, quite often you'd review work and it wasn't quite there. And as with most clients, you could, you know, you could do that with Lloyd's, phone them up and say, we've just reviewed the work. We're not quite there. Do you mind if we present next Thursday as opposed to on Tuesday? And the Financial Times said, absolutely not. You've got to present on Tuesday. And so when we went off site with them on the shared agenda, uh, we said, you know, why are you so obsessed with us presenting on time? And they said, we produce a national newspaper every single day. How come you can't produce an advertising campaign? And you just thought, that's right. So then that became part of the shared agenda with the FT that we would always present on time because it was something that, so I think clients have a lot of sort of specific idiosyncrasies. So it's not one size fits all. And I think it really behoves agencies to understand what are the sort of specific idiosyncrasies and characteristics of that client. And I think if they do that, they'll find that the clients themselves will then be prepared to understand the agency more and what motivates agencies and so on. I, and I think I think that's probably the thing that, that I wish I understood more. That's really good advice. I remember when um, the, probably the only arguments I've had with my ECDs in the past have usually come down to the fact that I, I remember often saying, I totally agree with your recommendation, yeah. but what you've got to understand is I have to sell this idea sure. to a bunch of accountants, yes. right? Effectively, yes. right? The, who do not live in our world. Sure. They do not understand, you know, yeah. I mean, if I was working on Cadbury, can you imagine selling in a drumming gorilla? Absolutely. I mean, 
like you'll be laughed out the room. I mean, genuinely laughed out the room. So you you need to help me. Help me. You know, you instinctively know, right? You instinctively know this is a brilliant idea. It's going to create fame. Everyone's going to talk about it. It'll go viral. I get that. Help me sell it in. And that's always, that was always the bit that I found a bit of a strain. In fact, weirdly, it's actually why I work at System One. Because what I found with System One is by pre-testing with the audience, you often gave the rational case for doing something quite emotional yes. that, that people wouldn't necessarily understand. Yes. So it was often the thing that unlocked the big, you know, how on earth are we going to sell this crazy idea in? You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I think, I think again, you know, that, that guerrilla ad was, you know, done in the 2000s. I, I think that agencies have become much more conversant on this. And I think that, yeah. I think everyone collectively is much more literate in terms of how advertising works, how it needs to be sold in, how it meets business problems. So I think I think many of those issues have have, have yeah. improved significantly. You're spot on. I mean, yeah. the, the evidence base, the theory, yeah. you know, the, the, the amount of work that goes into it, I yeah. totally agree. And in fact, you know, I, I certainly feel as a marketer now, we're so well equipped with with data and Absolutely. and you know books on it and yeah, you know right exactly. you know podcasts for example yeah. you know yeah. so we, we've almost had the, the the sort of mirror career right yeah. so yeah. so I think we're a similar sort of age. Yeah. Um, I've spent twenty or so years client side, and yeah. in the last four years, I've done. I'm now working for an agency, sure. effectively, well, yeah. a platform, I suppose. Yeah. But but you know, I'm in the industry of helping what you know clients like I used to be yes. Yes. make great advertising. Yeah. So it's kind of like you know a bit of a flip. Absolutely. And uh, when I, I had about six months between jobs, I got fired by Brewdog and uh, then had to suddenly find myself out of a job. And uh, what how, was, how unique to be fired I by know, Brewdog. I know, exactly. Breaking news. You've got to be the only person in Britain that's ever know, been fired that's by Brewdog. That's never happened before. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The first and only CMO. Yeah. Which is yeah probably worthy of another podcast episode actually before I go down that little rabbit warren, but in the six months between leaving there and then starting, what what something quite funny happened, which is I just got inundated with calls from agencies, and they said, John, can you come and do some training on how to pitch to a CMO? Sure. You know how you know what do we not know about our customer? Yeah, yeah. And um, it was quite fun actually. I, I I kind of had loads of fun with different lots of, lots of different agencies, yeah. design and PR, creative media. And um, I used to kind of run this workshop, but I thought I'd just run a few of these past you to see what you think. Sure. The first thing that surprised agencies to know is I actually worked out that I spent in a typical week 5% of my time on yeah. communication, yeah. communications, right? Yeah. People are already shocked about that. They yeah. they kind of assume that as a CMO, I'm there thinking about advertising all the time. But I'm actually kind of doing finances. I'm doing budget. I'm doing training. I'm you know doing strategy. I'm doing you know everything else really. In, I'm doing custom presentations. About five percent of my time is on communication. I, I think I, I I sometimes think that creative agencies don't realise that the thing they do, although expensive, high profile, is actually still a minority of their customer's job. Do you, do you think that, does that ring true for you? Yeah, it definitely rings true. And I think the other sort of allied truth is that there's this sort of thought on the agency side that whilst that might be the case, the bit the client likes doing the most is the communications. And that's not true. Um, that, you know, I am as interested in, you know, talking to, you know, Halifax mortgage people about the problems with first time buyers or making the case for advertising or being in a brainstorming, talking about a new product proposition. That to me is as interesting as creating the new Lloyd's ad. So I, th- I think there's also this thing that, you know, it is five to 10% and the client thinks that's the cream of their job. Yeah. Um, well, it links me nicely to the next point, yeah. actually, because the, the times I got most excited by a creative idea was when it actually solved a business problem, not a creative, yes. not a comms problem sort yes. of thing. So as soon as I got an idea that I thought, oh, that could be our employee internal engagement platform, or, or I could go down to the factory and talk to them about, you know, how, you know the, how it's going to position the brand. It was those kind of things. Or when it kind of, so, so I always, um, one of the bits of advice I always gave is whenever you get a brief, right, you should ask one question, which is what's the business problem that this brief has led to, sure. that, that has led to this brief rather. Yeah. Because often what I find with briefs is briefs, um, you know, briefs will go, who's the audience? You know, yeah. what are the campaign objectives? You know, et cetera, et cetera, right? When's the deadline? Not everything in a brief is of equal equal value. And the other thing I know, I, I found, I mean, maybe this is just because I'm not very good at writing briefs, but it's often not written by the decision maker. Yeah. And often the decision maker's got access to far more intel about the business and where it's going and the strategy and often actually between a brief being written and a brief you know being responded to the world's changed as well i used to sit in debriefs gone 
oh, they've responded to the brief, but actually since then, you know, like, this thing has happened or whatever. And one bit of advice I used to give is like, when you get the brief, just ask for 20 or 30 minutes with the decision maker yeah. and just ask them two questions, right? Yeah. First question is, what's the business problem? Sure. The second question is, how will you decide? And what was interesting about that is whenever I did the training, not once did any agency I spoke to do that. Because what they said to me, they always said, oh, we can't possibly bother the clients. Mm. Like the client's really busy. Mm. And I'm like, they're going to be more busy yeah. if you get the answer wrong. You know what yeah, I mean? As, yeah. You know, so it's yeah, well I think it. it. I think, I think, I think it depends. I think, as you say, if you're in that situation where you're saying we can't bother the client, then the relationship's not good because the client would be delighted to be bothered and would, and, and as, you, as you say, it's not, you know, I've got into a bit of a, trouble about this with my agencies, but I don't place so much store on a sort of fixed brief because I think, as you say, it's rolling all the time. So, you know, I'll often just phone up the agency and say, this has happened or we've got this issue and I'm expecting the brief to evolve. And I think when it becomes too fixed in time, then is when you get into those problems and it becomes very much sort of us and them and we respond to the brief. Whereas I think what you want to do is to create a sort of single team where, you know, the, and you know, this is widely documented when the, you know, people don't know who's on the agency, who's on the client side and it's a single team. So, so yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I mean, interestingly, we, 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 in fact, won last night at the campaign media agency awards, the agency team of the year. And what the team was is half Lloyd's banking group people and half Zenith people. And they sit all together in uh, Zenith's offices and it's just a single team. And, uh, they won. They won the award that, for the best that, agency that team. Is, that's a, such a good, such a simple thing, and such a good tip. Yeah. So we so in in my experience now, uh, agency size. Yeah. Whenever I've said even spent one or two hours in reception, yeah. like just working in reception yeah. of one of our customers, the amount of conversations that lead to work. Yeah. Like I can almost guarantee it. Like people walk past and go, oh, John, I meant to talk to you about this thing I've got and this ad I'm creating. And can you give me a point of view on this? And it always leads to work. It's really funny. So if you can engineer a reason to physically be with your customer, it, it will pay off. No, I agree. Like, I, mean, I, I remember when we had the uh, Morrison's account, you know, which was a sort of set piece advertising account. We thought this was a big account, but there was this guy who ran another agency. He literally spent his life up there. And, uh, you know, all he was doing was going around from room to room, picking up briefs wherever he went to. And I remember sitting down with him one time and, and he was he told me that actually the size of his business was bigger than ours. Actually, you reminded me, actually, a, a former colleague of mine, Marcus, who was a, a top sales guy. In fact, he always phones me up after every episode, goes, when am I going to get a mention on your podcast? So, <laughs> Marcus, if you're listening or watching, this is it. But one of the things I learned from Marcus is um, Tesco, obviously, biggest customer yeah. for most FMCGs in the UK. There's a little tiny Costa coffee in their reception and he would literally just work there every day and would wait for the buyer to come in yeah. and then accidentally bump into them yeah. and go, oh, I'm glad I saw you yeah, because, yeah. you know, I'm here for some other meeting. Yeah, yeah. Not really, but, you know, no, it's and it's, great just, technique. it's just brilliant. I yeah. think, that, you know, those kind of hustles are, are key. Agreed. One of the other things I, used, I often uh, said when I did this was what I think lots of agencies get wrong is they, they sell... They sell the service they provide, not the solution they provide. And I always say, you know, sell sell the problem you're solving, not the service. So often in pitches, I know, you know or even induction presentations, it'll be like 50, 50 minutes of this is what we do, yeah. right? And there'll be the, this is the logo slide. This is our unique kind of approach, yeah. this sort of thing. And I remember, right, often stopping and going, can I just ask you, you've not once asked me a question. You haven't asked me what my problem is. Yeah. So how do you know what the solution is? Sure. I, I just find, I mean, I, it's the art. I mean, when I did uh, negotiation training years ago, they used to talk about the art of the customer interview, yeah. which is always start with some casual questions of, to the customer. Of, you know, how's your business going? Mm. You know, where, where, where are your objectives? What's keeping you up at night? All those. And then, of course, you can reverse nicely into it. Whereas you just go, here's my creds. Then you might miss the mark entirely. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the challenges for agencies is what currency is celebrated internally. Because I know that, you know, when I was creative agency side, you know, everyone would gather, you know, once a month and then people would show the latest ads, you know, so it was always about here's the new X TV ad, da, 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 and, and the new campaigns and so on. And so the currency that the, that the agencies value is their output. And I think that 
to your point, you know, there is opportunities for agencies to change the currency of what they value. So if they valued, you know, problem, you know, lateral solutions to problems or, you know, celebrating, di- you know, correct diagnoses of client problems and, and, and different solutions, then that would change that. So I think that is a significant opportunity for agencies. I'll tell you what I'd do, right? So I, I once, so again, we're work, working with a large soft drink company in the UK, yeah. we, had a, um, we had a big conference in Ireland and we actually invited the Tesco director of drinks, basically. Yeah. So probably the most powerful person in drinks because yeah. Tesco accounted for like 30% of all, you know, consumption of soft drinks in the retail sector and i was up with him very late very very late in yeah. the bar in fact you know i think he had a flight at 7 a.m yeah. we're still there at 5 a.m Going straight through exactly just, yeah. just just doing the straight through option and he said to me something that you could perceive as deeply arrogant yeah. right but was incredibly revealing he said to me how are you going to get me promoted yeah and i thought Damn it, that is such a good question. Now it's now most people are real going, bloody hell, <laughs> that's a bit arrogant, isn't it? Who do you think you are? Yeah. But I, I thought, there it is. Yeah. So what what came off the back of that conversation is I said, okay, well, health is the single biggest issue that we sure. face as an age. This yeah. was a few years ago when the sugar yeah. tax was coming in. Yeah. We are committed to creating a revolution in healthy drinks. Sure. Yeah. We will collaborate and I will give you exclusivity on all our initiatives. Yeah. You know, and and make sure that you get. And in fact, what we'll do is we'll do joint press activity yeah. together. We'll get on Sky and BBC and talk about it together, a sort of thing, so that you get the benefit of the publicity. And it transformed our relationship. But yeah. it started from a, what perceived as an arrogant question: How are you going to get me promoted? I just wonder, as an agency, if you thought, yeah, you right. know, how can I get my client promoted? I think promotion is 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 sort of you know nakedly venal um yes, yeah. so so I, I think i'd probably shy away from from that specific but i think if you can do something which would result in a promotion yeah, so yeah. what i was always very fixated on which i i still think has great relevance is agreeing some quite exciting language so you know in your case you would say right we want to make tesco you know the key partner in the revolution in um, soft drink, healthy yeah. soft drink. So you've established this sort of bridgehead, this mantra that you're going towards. And that's what I always used to try and do with my clients is, is say, right, we, you know, if, if it was, you know, Morrison's issue at the time was they weren't um, associated with good fresh food. And I say, we are going to solve the Morrison's fresh food problem. So that becomes the mantra. So you only ever talk about the mantra. So then that becomes your gift to the client that they in turn can say, I am going to be the person who are going to change Morrison's perception for fresh food. And then hopefully they'll get promoted off the back of it. That's, that's a very nice way of doing it. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> not quite the naked ambition of get me promoted. No, no, but no, the no, outcome's think, the same. Yeah, production yeah, yeah, and everyone feels the, better along the, the way. Byproduct. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Well done. Another thing uh, as well, I, I, I notice as, as a client is often I, like how on earth do you pick an agency because like even those top 100 lists are intimidating i mean i used to think like when i um looking for a new pr agency for example a few years ago i'd go top 100 pr agencies there are 2000 pr agencies in the uk it turns out there's a top 100 list and you and no one's got time to do that so- the only way around I found it is a, a friend of mine, Gav, who runs a PR agency in London. I, I used to phone him up and say, Gav, who are the three agencies you fear when yeah. you're pitching against yeah. them? Yeah. You know, so sort of like, and you go, oh, right. They'll tell you what, the three that if, if they turn up, I know we're toast or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I used to use that as a way of deciding. But sure. how, do, how, what would you advise a client in terms of how do you pick an agency? Like, I think... You know, obviously looking at some of the work that they produce and thinking, do I like that kind of work? And I think that, uh, you know, the advantage with creative work, unlike with media agencies, is that uh, there's a massive variety of, amongst it. So you, you can you can see. And I do think agencies tend to produce particular kinds of work. So I think I think that acts as a good filter. I think it does, you know, come down to people. You know, I think I think that all of the best client agency relationships come down to the relationship between the people. And I think it's incredibly quick and easy to, to discern. I think you, you know, you know, I always felt when I was agency side, I was instant, you know, the clients that instantly we'd get on with. And then there were clients we just knew, you know, we'd never worked with in a thousand years. And we, you know, they went out and we just like no chemistry whatsoever. And I think you get a really good feeling and it's incredibly important because you spend 
so much time with them and you need to trust them completely and get that they're on the completely the same page as you. So I, th- I think the, you know, the personal part of it is hugely important. I could not agree more. The, the people buy from, I think with our obsession with technology yeah. and with automation, yeah. we somehow forget. That, and also purchasing departments really screw this up because yeah. they, they're talking about hour, hourly rate billings sure, and, sure. and terms and payment yeah. days and all this yeah. kind of thing. Whereas actually the power of a strong relationship and, and also a long relationship yeah. as well, where, where you really yeah. trust each other. Yeah. In fact, all the best campaigns and I think most successful CMOs have had on my show actually have been enrolled for seven, eight, nine years. Yeah. And they've got there, you know, th- you know, by being persistent and building a level of trust with an agency. Yeah. No, it's I so true. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You want to stay with the same agency as long as you possibly can. As you demonstrate, actually, yes. very yes. well with your, your yes. recent campaign. exactly. Um, one, of the things, one of the funny things I noticed on that point, actually, yeah. is I remember once running a pitch process, and uh, at the end of it, I, I was like, absolutely, this agency did the best pitch and did yeah. the best presentation. And I got together with the team, and we, we went back and looked at the PowerPoints, yeah. and I realized something quite interesting is, the PowerPoint didn't match up to how I felt no. the meeting had gone. Because I remember saying, this agency is the best. No oh. question. It was the best pitch, best presentation, oh. best idea. And then we, we looked at it and we went, oh, actually, it's not. And what I realized is what I was buying into is the person, mm. their, you know, the questions they asked, the energy they had, the commitment, the way they brought it to life. And, it, you know, it, it, it's definitely a technique, isn't it, is that so much of, you know, how we feel comes through. It's not what's said. It's how, it's how no, you feel. Well, that's you know, the how great, feel, uh, the famous Maya Angelou Indeed. quote, which is <laughs> always on the tube, isn't it, about, you know, they'll forget what you said, but they'll never yeah. forget what, how you made them feel. So Now, one other, one other thing as well I often advise agencies to do, which I very rarely see, is provide the evidence that it works. I mean, this is where I, I love the fact you talked about IPF sure. Excellence Awards. Yeah. And I remember bumping into um, a founder of a big agency, yeah. this is just after I started working for System One, yeah. and uh, we, we were just both on stage at some conference and chatting afterwards. And he said he had this really big pitch for a global yeah. airline coming up. And I said to him, I said, tell you what, I'll guarantee you a pitch win. And he's like, how are you going to do that? I said, well, no client, no, sorry, no agency ever pitched to me having already tested their idea with consumers. Now, yeah. sometimes they might have done a focus group or two oh. with a few sound bites. And I said to him, I've just started working at System One, right? I've literally, I think it was about my first week or something. I said, look, I'll do all the testing for free for you. Let's test this out, right? And what was interesting about the pitch is it wasn't just that they won the pitch. The idea they had was three times, I think it was three times the production costs that the oh. client had given them, yeah, right? Yeah. Because they had this very audacious idea and sure. they had a safe idea and an audacious idea. Yeah. And this, we really want the audacious idea, but it was very technically challenging. Yeah. And what I was able to do is, um, not only was I able to test it, but I was able to test it and show that the results of the audacious idea more than paid back mm. the extra production sure. in its predicted in predicted performance. Yeah. And, I, and, and I said, I said, look, if, if I come in as an independent and say, you know, as part of your pitch and go, they care so much, they've gone and spent this money testing it with your, your audience. I mean, it's quite a specific audience as well. Yeah, we had to yeah, go and yeah. find the very particular yeah. audience here. It, it, it was the difference. Yeah. It, and, and I'm surprised that no, given... It's a- it's a that's it's a it's a win. I mean, and you know, to be fair, it's only recently um, with methodologies such as your own where you can turn it around quite quickly that that has become available. The other th- other top tip um, which we used to use is to focus group our idea with the staff before the pitch. So we used to take you know our campaigns into Halifax branches or into Morrison stores and film them responding to the campaign and then play that back as part of our pitch. That was, that was also fairly, fairly effective. Yeah. And then it became internally validated. So it's pretty difficult to uh, turn down a campaign, which you can see your, you know, Bristol branch. That right there is absolute top tip because what what you've understood there is that your customer has a customer. Yeah. So even the CMO or the marketing director, a big organization is serving the staff, employees, oh. shareholders, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And if you play a reel that just goes, look at the reactions to this yeah. new campaign from, yeah. from our own know, staff. Everyone has in their, in their pitch that first slide, what do we do? Yeah. You know, we length and breadth of the country. We went to every store, went to every branch, you know, which means nothing, yeah. you know, compared to an absolute video where you've gone into, you know, as we used to, their sort of stand-up, call, stand-up meetings first thing and said, can we show you our new campaign and what you think? And actually filmed it and it's part of their actual, you know, team meeting. So that, that was 
Absolutely. But I, I, lo- I also love the fact that your job is to represent the customer. Yeah. No one knows the customer better than the sure. staff on the front line Absolutely. who are selling every day, sure. in this case, Halifax yeah. mortgages, right? Yeah. They know their customer. And if they like the ad, well, not only have you passed the, as an agency, we're too far up our analysis yeah, half yeah. the time yeah. test, yeah. as in yeah. this is real people, Absolutely. but it's real people who know exactly what the customer wants. Exactly. That's genius. Yeah. yeah. Very, very good tip that. Talking about great advertising, I'd love to talk a little bit about the recent Lloyd's sure, work. So one of the things, again, I sorry, plug for System One here, of course, yes. you know, we, we love a fluent device. Yes. It's sort of the, yes. probably the, my colleague Orlando is the thing he's most well known for. But, you know, you've got this wonderful asset, haven't you, in, in, in Lloyd's. So when you took over, were you tempted to change it? How do you make a decision about what to change and what not to change? No, I mean, you you know, the person who uh, who who drops the black horse, you know, should be fired. I mean, that that is worth its weight in gold. You cannot tell, you know, how far ahead of any other, you know, advertiser in Britain, financial services advertiser in Britain at the moment, the Lloyd's advertising is. And it's because of the black horse that the moment you see it, you know it's a Lloyd's ad. It's an absolutely uh, priceless asset. So on no account would I have ever considered dropping the black horse. I mean, it, it, but you are exactly right, though. That, 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 I think, is the point. And what it allows you to do as well in multimedia yeah. is ensure that wherever you are, so whether your website, whether it's in a social media feed or outdoor poster or it's on TV, you don't have to say Lloyd's, do you? You don't have to say Lloyd's. You show Lloyd's, which I think is the magic of it. Yeah, and I, and I think that's incredibly fortunate because, you know, the Black Horse is obviously a very visually appealing, fluent device. And I was interested to hear the creative director of Leo Burnett the other day, and she was talking about, you know, the arches at the beginning of the eyebrows ad. And, you know, she's also lucky that you have a very... Um, visually appealing and easy to, you know, in this case, write on a post-it note, fluent device. And I think the problems occur when brands don't have those. And then how do you deal with the branding challenge? But no, in the case of Lloyd's and in the case of, you know, Scottish Widows, where we had a widow, you know, which again is, you know, um, a very recognized, long established branding device, which, which, which people are very happy to have in, in the advertising. And I think, I think, you know, I was, I was, um, you know, I love your quote, the System One quote about familiarity breeds contentment. And I think this is one of the the key issues in advertising in Britain at the moment was that consumers love things that are familiar. So people love to see the black horse because unconsciously, I know where I am. This is a Lloyd's ad. Unconsciously, there's my meerkat. I'm fine. You know, whether it's, you know, Kevin Bacon for EE or whatever it is, people, consumers crave familiarity and you know, agency creative communities crave originality and there's a disconnect between those two things. Massive disconnect, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we we spend a lot of our time celebrating originality, don't we, rather than familiarity. There there isn't a award for running running the campaign, the same one, for 10 years. Congratulations. No, Lloyds would never win a creative award because... What's new? You yeah, know, you're just using your black horse again. In fact, we're cheating. We, 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 yeah, we, we were debating actually. We, we have debated this quite a lot of system on whether to create our own awards. Yeah, and one of the one of the awards we would create yeah. is consistent use of the same idea. Absolutely, and demonstrating the return on that as familiarity, you know, as it wears in, because sure. actually we've proven sure. it wears in. Yeah. Now, if I was a CMO on a new brand today. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing, the most important thing I've learned from System One in my time, and I wish I learned this before, I would obsess about creating a fluent device. Yes. Absolutely obsess about it because the payback is enormous. I mean, I, I, I use this, I use this example so so often. It's probably <laughs> listeners will get bored of it, but like Churchill the dog, I think yeah. is a brilliant example because we actually for, we tested it for direct line. And what we found is the five second version for social matched the 30 seconds yeah. because what happened in the audience is they immediately knew who it was, but also they, all the humor and emotion was triggered by the dog, right? The, the, the dog kind of with his kind of blah, 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 sort of thing going on immediately worked. Yeah. And that you just get to a level that is efficient. You save yourself media money, you know, in terms of production costs, it's easier. And, and as you say, you know, performance just goes up. No, well, I used to have this um, discussion a lot with one of your competitors who did do the tracking for Lloyd's Banking Group. And I said to the woman who was who was sort of in charge of creative effectiveness, you know, every single campaign that, you know, we track that does well, and every single example you've ever shown me has a branded character. So I said, why don't I just mandate every single brief 
that it has to have a branded character because you've never shown me a single campaign that has worked as well, which doesn't have a branded character. And you're saying the same about films totally, devices. Totally same. So they're, then they're my question the to agencies is, why would you not set up an agency and say, we only produce branded characters, we only produce fluent devices? Because it is so easy to prove that that's the most effective. That, that right there is a genius idea. Anyone listening, you want to set up a new agency. If you did that... The evidence is spectacular. Yeah. And also, I think I'm right in saying Orlando's uh, has looked at award-winning, I think I'm right in saying, award-winning campaigns over the last 15, 20 years. Fluent devices' presence in awards have gone down from 40%, I think, to 50 I need to check it with him. But it's something like 40% to about 15 yeah. So they're out of fashion. So it also means you've got a lovely advantage is there aren't that many in your, probably not in your category, there aren't that many. So you'll also, you have a competitive advantage. Be, you know, the BM, they great days of BMP, you know, yeah. Hofmeister Bear and, yeah. uh, um, you know, all, all of, you know, the, the, you know, they did loads, the tree ball, yeah. um, soft, you know, mint man, you know, it used to be much more fashionable, but I think, it, I think it's, you know, a really interesting existential question for agencies. Why? when this is clearly the most proven way to produce effective advertising, is it not more treasured internally? And to build on that as well, the thing that I think people have not understood is it, it's more important today than it was because yeah. it used to be the case that yeah. you could break in Coronation Street, your ad, everyone yeah. would see it and go, ha ha, the Hofmeister bear, that's really funny, yeah. right? The problem everyone's got now is different Diff- different platforms, even you know, even on TV, you've got a multitude of platforms, but you've got different you know, social media, out of home, digital, all the rest of it. But what the Fluent device does is it connects all that together. So even if you're high attention versus low attention, you actually can overcome the short attention span of the kind of media that dominates today. That's what Fluent devices can do for you. Absolutely. And I think, I think you know, you, you give some examples. And I think for that reason, visual devices are best because I think visual devices transfer much better across the full media mix than sort of conceptual devices like, you know, should have gone to Specsavers is something that works well in TV. You can get it to work in posters. It's very difficult to work in multiple formats. Anything that's a sort of conceptual idea is tricky to get across media. Totally right. Um, now, so coming to your System 1 results, yes. Bo, congratulations. So I, I pulled it off the database just to check. So yeah. the latest campaign, which is still on air, I noticed even yeah. last yeah. night, which is which is there. Yeah. Wonderful, very, very emotive. Um, you scored a star score, was 4.7. It's in the top 1% in the consumer banking category, which is exceptional. So well done. Spike rating is a short term, 1.35, also exceptional. Fluency, 90%, which again is driven by the horse. Brilliant. Uh, you came sixth. Out of 678. So well done. I'd like to know what the other five are. Very impressive. I can tell tell you later, yes. (laughs) Yeah. Indeed. Um, In fact, I think the seventh was another version of the same same ad as well. So you've got a couple of spots there, which is brilliant. But looking at that, looking at the last five years, that was the best performing campaign of that series you've done. So what was different about this one? Because it definitely was your best version of it. Because I think this was the first time where we said, could we... Um, you know, all Lloyd's advertising to date have been pure brand, as we called it. So, so it just operated at a pure brand level. And this is the first one we said, can we actually relate it to a consumer need and actually end with a product? So it actually ends with a, uh, uh, an account called the Smart Start account, which is a, a account for kids between 11 and 15. So it's the first one we said, can we keep everything that's good about Lloyd's advertising, but actually relate it to a consumer need? So it became about this notion of, building children's confidence. So, you know, the metaphor was the girl on the bike and she progresses, but this is a metaphor for the way that, that children can build their financial confidence. So, um, you know, that, that's so sort of gratifying to uh, to hear this data. And it also won't surprise you to know that the uh, the correct, uh, the company that actually has done the tracking, we've had no results from them so far. So, oh, you, yeah, because oh, no. so, oh, okay. obviously they don't work on your, uh, on our on your, super fast time, on your time modern, modern time frames. Yeah. So, no, I think that that was our hope was that we could keep everything that was good about Lloyd's advertising. I think it's a, you know, This Girl on Fire is obviously a spectacular um, track. It's upbeat, it's populist, it's big. So, uh, you know, I, we were always incredibly hopeful for this ad. So well, that's you, great you, to hear. You, it, it is. And, and in fact, you, I mean, we tend to have kind of five 
general bits of advice yeah. for anyone making advertising yeah. and and you you hit all of them so f- first one i know is obvious because of course system one which is emotion yeah. the, the the story was emotional yes. and 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 yeah we have yeah, the second point is story arc you know yes. you've got the story arc right because yeah. you actually you, you play with a bit of negative tension in there yes. don't you when she falls yeah. off the bike which yeah, is lovely exactly. and then you get a lovely scene at the end yes. where clearly she's on having yeah the having a yeah. brilliant time yeah. so you know you feel you feel for her and you yeah. feel with her and it's great um character as well i thought yeah. that you know the cat the, the acting was great you know yeah. you, you followed you know as orlando would say you've got a story that unfolds you yeah. follow the character yeah. narrative through as well yeah. fluent device obviously the horse you, interacts with the you know with the girl as well so you've got you know you've got your fluent device running through one of the things you got brilliantly right was um soundtrack yes. i mean what a soundtrack that oh, was that's, and that's i know i'm I, I mean, i'm sure you can't say how much it costs but they're big decisions, aren't they? You know, when you're having to kind of invest quite a lot of money. Mm. But in this one, I mean, in fact, I, in fact, I was saying this to you, I was watching TV last night, it came on. I was actually out of the room and I heard the track as I yeah. walked in and went, oh yeah, there's the Lloyds ad. Yeah. So it just, it's another way. Did you do it on radio, by the way? Yeah, no, yeah. it's on radio. Yeah. Okay, no. with the same soundtrack? Uh, yes, no, yeah. no, no. I, and, I, and I, you know... <laughs> It's quite, it's, I do not think, you know, and, and hopefully someone will prove me wrong, I do not think it's possible to produce a better Lloyds ad than that ad. I think yeah. it's as, as good as we've ever done. I do yeah. not know how well, to make a better one. And, statistically, um, you're, you're yeah. right. I mean, you've, yeah. got to, you've got to go to the top half a percent yeah. to beat that one. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. No, I think you're on the money. Well yeah. done. Uh, good way to end on a high. Indeed. Which is actually one of our bits of advice, actually, is that uh, you remember how you felt at the end of something. Exactly. Therefore, you kind of, you, you did that, Richard, which is brilliant. Richard Shotton just talked about. In his he did. Peak end indeed, effect, indeed. Was, yeah. well, actually, I was very reassured by that because like we've been preaching that for a long, long yeah. time. And then he came with, oh, the study in 1950 yeah. showed yeah, yeah, that, yeah, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah, so, yeah, which true. is always, I love Richard for that. Because yes, you, exactly. can, you can roll out a good, you know, a good study or two, yes. you know, to back up what you're saying, which is lovely. Maybe let's end here because I know we were chatting a bit in, in the previous conversation about low attention and high attention media yeah. and it probably builds on what we've been talking about actually yeah. is that in the last 20 years there's been a complete revolution in in media and, and how we communicate but as karen nelson field has shown like you don't have long right in low attention media so i think she worked out the average was well i think she worked out it takes two and a half seconds to start to create memory mm. and the average I think, you know, low attention media is about two seconds. So like 80% of media, you know, we've lost, we've, you know, people have clicked through before there's any chance to build media. Um, But as obviously creative agencies, we love to design things for high attention media. How do you, you know, how how can we resolve that? And I think, I think one of the, one of the things I might challenge you on is uh, whether high attention media is in fact high attention media at all. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, what, you know, has been extensively documented in the last 20 years is that consumers, even in what you just referred to as high attention media, consume advertising in a low attention way. So, you know, back to Robert Heath and low involvement processing. And I think that that is another big issue for agencies. And I, and I was fascinated to hear Jenny Romanuk on, on your show a couple of weeks ago, where she talked about the fact that if you are designing for a high attention world, you know, you're flawed. And she said that the art and science of designing advertising is designing it for a low attention world. And I think that is absolutely spot on. And I think, again, that places a huge challenge to agencies because I think that agencies produce advertising often for people that they know who process the advertising in a high attention way. So you see a lot of constructs where you get a series of vignettes which are telling, you know, creating a confection or creating a mystery, which is then revealed at the end that these vignettes, which you've in a high attention way sat through, wow, these were the, you know, campaign for living miserably, you know, these were the, you know, incredibly moving if you watch it in a high attention way. But the reality, as has been so extensively documented, is that consumers do not take advertising in that way. So, you know, again, this is a massive challenge for agencies. Do you... Do you acknowledge that your profession, your life, your work is only processed in a low involvement, low attention system one way? The thing that you've given your life to, do you accept that people don't really care about it? The best bit of advice I ever heard on this podcast was Sarah Carter a few weeks ago. Yeah. And she said, your customer doesn't give a shit. Yeah, correct. She said, start from a point of indifference. Yes. Right. And that I cannot tell you is the best bit of advice you're ever going to hear. You, sure. you need to start assuming no one cares. Yeah. No one's going to see it. 
And, and if you start with that, you've got a chance. I think to your challenge, actually, the, the, one of my favorite charts that or- Orlando's created, he did some work with Lumen. Mm-hmm. looking at actual attention. So obviously yeah. we we predict emotional sure. response, but yeah. what we did is partner with Lumen to look at to what extent do people actually watch the ads, right? Yeah. And so we follow, you know, follow, followed them, follow them up after seeing the advertising. Did they remember, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. It was so fascinating. Yeah. And and, and this th- th- really profound stuff. So we looked at TV, we looked at YouTube, we looked at Facebook, we looked at Twitter and so on. And then what we found was there was a, I need to get this right, actually. <laughs> there was a quite a big difference between high and low attention yeah. on average, yeah. something like three or four times. Sure. So if you're looking at like a YouTube and TV, sure. you do see sure. significant more minutes. Yes. I mean, yes. three, four, five times, sure. right? What we then did is we then we then basically tested a one-star ad versus a five-star ad. Yeah. And then there's a multiplier on that of two or three times. So you get to, the, you get to this situation where if you get a high-attention media I should probably say higher attention. Yes, yes. Yeah, because high attention suggests yeah. I'm watching the ad all the way exactly. through. So that's your point, right? Yeah. No no one does that, no. right? So yeah. let's start with the fact yeah. that you're starting from sure. a, everyone's yeah. starting from a low base, yeah. right? So it's higher attention. Yeah. But you see the difference between emotive creative is is two or three times. So we had a, in fact, we had a Barclay card ad, yeah. which we, I, one of my favorites actually is for prevention. This might answer your question about who's yeah. above you in the league, actually. Yeah, yeah. So do you remember this? Barclay card ad, which which opens, it's very hard to spot fraud. Oh, and it's got these yeah. gorillas playing cricket. Yeah. And then the people walk past going, what's going on? And then they yeah. turn out to be actors, you know, it, that, that's that's how it plays out. Yeah. And it's like fraud prevention. I mean, like imagine selling that one in. So we've got a very serious fraud prevention yeah. ad here. We've got these gorillas playing cricket, you know, back to animals and fun and human. Anyway, yeah. all very good. So that, and then we had a, an Apple ad, which was for the HomePod. Yeah. And it was basically a product ad. It yeah. was just this thumping, repeating, oh. you know, thumping, repeating yeah. kind of, New Apple port is out now sort of thing. The difference was like three three X oh, in yeah. terms of the minutes of actual attention received, yes, yeah. irrespective. Well, actually, no, I, I need to adjust that slightly. The same effect happened, but on a high uh, attention media, the elasticity was greater yeah. because you, you, you had more chance to draw the audience Absolutely. in. On low attention media, the elasticity was much lower. Sure. So you, it was better, but lower. Yeah. So you do need to design Absolutely. differently and and start off in the low attention media and, and have that as your challenge. Agreed. Which weirdly comes back to fluent devices. Yes. Because the best shot you've got, I think, of doing all of that is by having, you know, characters that actually kind of, you know, appear throughout the, all those different 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 points. No, I agree. I mean, I th- and I think that, you know, is the big issue is at what point in the ad are you does your brand appear? And uh, I think I think this is one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about in the last two two weeks is is that you know a lot of advertising that the advertising industry most like you know the brand won't appear until the end whereas you know in reality the the advertising that works best that you know consumers are clear who the brand is from the beginning well i'll give you the evidence of that so barker card fraud prevention is a five-star ad yeah. it opens with a blue screen yeah and it with Barclay Card logo and the question, if only fraud was this easy yeah. to spot, right? Yeah. It it puts the audience in the right show. Yeah. Exactly. And then and then the play begins. Yeah. And but the I branding, know where I am. The branding I know, exactly. Yeah. Immediately I'm like, oh yeah. Barclay Cards, yeah. right? And then and then you've got this brilliant level of entertainment, which yeah. you just see on the graph is just yeah off the scale engagement from the beginning. Absolutely. And then people as we've seen with our work with Lumen, people uh, more likely, I won't say high attention because yeah. you know, again, it's not like a yeah. Hollywood blockbuster. But you got your best chance of getting them to stay. Totally agree. Brilliant. Well, that sounds like the perfect place to end, Richard. Thank you very much. Oh, it's a pleasure. Great to really have you on enjoyed the show. it. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much for listening to the Uncensored CMO. I hope you enjoyed my conversation there with Richard Warren. If you want to find out more and you want to follow me, you can do. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts uh, or on YouTube. And if you want to follow me, I'm over on Twitter at Uncensored CMO. And you can find me on LinkedIn at John Evans. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you next time. Thank you.